the memory of the man who really is behind it. As Aldo Leopold observed in his writings, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as a community in which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. Dr. Keeney exemplifies the essence of that belief in his role as the Leopold Center director. He took the new concept of the center and really ran with it. He helped form issue-based communities of researchers from several disciplines who then tackle these very difficult and challenging problems associated with production agriculture and really crafted it into the study of sustainable agriculture. And that was really, that was 20 years ago, so that was not a common thing for that day. And yet somehow Dennis had the foresight, the vision, and the ability to bring together a community of scientists and for those scientists to work with farmers so that the research was addressing problems that were on their farm in their fields. Dr. Keeney's leadership of the Leopold Center reflects where he came from. He grew up on a dairy farm near Runnels, and then he decided to go to college, and he came here to Iowa State, got his bachelor's degree in agronomy at Iowa State, moved on to Wisconsin to get a master's degree uh, there in soil science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Then he decided to come back to Iowa State University and got his doctorate degree in soil biochemistry. With his education and training, he has pioneered research and outreach, outreach in re agricultural issues related to sustainability, land use, rural community development, and water quality. Dr. Keeney has also served as president of the American Society of Agronomy and the Soil Science Society of America, again reflecting his passion both for science and for the profession. But sustainable agriculture is just one of his passions, and I happen to know about this. You may not have known that he's a he was a dedicated runner. He runs now. We, we sort of talked about different things, but he, during the time that he was here as the director of the Leopold Center, often while I was on runs uh, with my colleagues over the noon hour, I would run into Dennis and his friends, and we'd chat about this, and often we'd end up throughout the year running in the same road races. I'd see him, and he was passionate about his running. And it's really his commitment uh, to health through running that uh, is much like his commitment to the health of farming and the environment uh, through sustainable agriculture. It is a testament to Dr. Keeney's ability, skills, and knowledge that the Leopold Center has thrived after his capable launch. And given the, medic, the many political and economic challenges that Iowa has faced, uh, even the critical Des Moines Register's editorial page paid a compliment to Dr. Keeney upon his retirement when it stated, Keeney kept the center on the cutting edge of progressive agriculture, championed the concepts of low-impact farming, and survival of the small farm. Aldo would have been proud of one of his most devoted pupils. Ladies and gentlemen, Dennis Keedy. Thanks, Joe, for that wonderful introduction. It brings back a lot of memories, and um, this auditorium is so wonderful. I have not been in it until tonight. Thanks a lot for getting it done, Wendy, and all those that helped you. Um, and all I can say is 20 years. I can't believe it was 20 years ago. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> I really am happy to have our guest speaker tonight. The uh, gentleman I'm going to introduce is a good friend. We've been involved in committee work at uh, Johns Hopkins and board work. We've been involved in some other issues that uh, we've overlapped in. So it's, it's great to have Bob here as a as our lecturer. He has an incredible list of achievements. They go on and on. And they, but they all center on one overabiding theme. Bob is dedicated to the world's people and to their health and welfare. Bob and his lovely wife, Cynthia. And Cynthia, perhaps you could stand up right now and be recognized. <laughs> Are both natives of Connecticut. Uh, Bob received degrees from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School. He's trained in internal medicine at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, which, uh, and we have family in Boston, so this brings us together again. 
He has served in the Center for Disease Control, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, the Cambridge Hospital, and was director of the health services at the Rockefeller Foundation. This is one of his real dedications. He founded the Johns Hopkins Center for Liberal Future in 1996. This great organization focuses attention on equity, health, and the Earth's resources, and I'm part of that uh, a board on one of those in that organization. He also founded the Physicians for Human Rights organization, and this is a fantastic organization. And he's participated in human rights investigators on behalf of PHR in many third world countries. I think there could be many stories right there in what Bob has seen. He is also providing support for the current Pew Commission on, be, uh, on behalf of on, uh, industrial animal farm production. And uh, the director of the center, past director of the center, Fred Kirschman, is also on that commission. In uh, 2002, Bob received one of the most prestigious awards, the Albert Schweitzer Prize for humanitarianism. humanitarianism. We've had the privilege of having Bob and Cynthia with us at our home for the past few days, and it's been a real delight. Bob is an avid biker, and I hear he also was a good cross-country and track runner, so we have another thing in common. I found another thing out about Bob you would never know. <laughs> he was team's physician for a high school football team in rural North Carolina, and I thought that was the greatest thing. I can imagine the Cyclones could have used his service some on Saturday and even the week before. Anyway, please help me welcome uh, Dr. Lawrence speaking about the agriculture public health connection. Thank you very much, Dennis. Um, Dennis and Betty have been great hosts and hostesses. We've uh, met Friday afternoon down in Des Moines at a, a conference that uh, Dennis was participating in, and I got my early introduction to the excitement of uh, the kinds of things that go on here in Iowa with regard to sustainable agriculture. And then we went to that uh, exciting football game that was almost a... Uh, a uh, really great upset. Um, got to the concert yesterday afternoon, met many of uh, Dennis and Betty's friends and colleagues, and then today had wonderful interactions with uh, students and staff of the Leopold Center. So it's a wonderful thing to be here, and I thank all of you for uh, coming out this evening, really to honor uh, Dennis, not uh, necessarily to hear me, although you have to put up with me in order to honor Dennis. Um, when I was thinking about what is a city boy from Baltimore who grew up partly in uh, Yonkers and Hell's Kitchen uh, have to say uh, about sustainable agriculture uh, to a group of distinguished uh, uh, scientists at the oldest uh, land-grant university in the United States? Well, Dennis got me off the hook by saying I should focus on the impact of agriculture on health um, and the connection, but it still doesn't quite get me off the hook. So I want to tell you a brief story before I get started. There was a survivor of the Johnstown flood in Pennsylvania. I was born in Philadelphia, so I heard a lot of Pennsylvania stories before my family moved to uh, Yonkers. And this man uh, basically supported himself for the rest of his life by going around and telling the story of the Johnstown flood and how he miraculously escaped it. He finally got old and he died. And when he got to the pearly gates, he was a little surprised when St. Peter said, welcome, but you need to know one of the expectations while you're with us through eternity is that uh, you will be in charge of the evening entertainment and give a talk sometime during your first year of residence. He thought, well, I'll just use my Johnstown blood talk. It's no problem. So a couple of months later, uh, he got the call from St. Peter that it was his turn. And he showed up and people were sitting around like this and he was just getting ready to speak when St. Peter leaned over to him and said, remember, Noah's in the audience. <clears throat> well, I look out here and I see a couple of Noah's in the front row and some Noah's back there, so uh, please bear with me. <clears throat> Dennis.
Dennis mentioned the center. What we attempted to do was trace the relationship between uh, human health and diet, which has been a subject of public health for many, many years. The environmental impacts on public health have similarly been a subject of public health scrutiny for many years. But talking about food production and food systems and how they connect to both the food we eat and the state of the environment in which we live had not been addressed in public health before. I was also concerned about the fact that we were dealing with the carrying capacity of the planet, uh, finite resources, and continued growth in our population, and then the central driver of equity, that if we are to do the right thing by developing sustainable food production systems, to share them equitably around the world, then there were going to have to be some fairly profound changes. The center uh, is based in part on Sir Albert Howard's uh, famous quote from 1939, the whole problem of health in soil, plant, animal, and man is one great subject. Of a faculty of 450 people at the School of Public Health when I proposed starting the center, we had one bona fide ecologist and he was working on hantavirus and rats. That's an important problem, but it doesn't give the kind of breadth of ecologic perspective that Sir Albert Howard uh, was talking about. But we were fortunate in being able to reach out to other faculty and to reach out to people like Dennis, who have generously shared of their time and expertise to help us along. But maybe this connection is going to be a hard thing to fit together. Wendell Berry said, there is no connection between food and health. People are fed by a food industry which pays no attention to health and are healed by a health industry that pays no attention to food. And I can tell you, when I was a medical student, what I learned about human nutrition, I could summarize in about three sentences. That would be a list of the essential amino acids and the micronutrients that everybody should have. Why? Figure it out yourself, we were told. <clears throat> now, uh, you've already heard from Joe Coletta that uh, this wonderful quote, but I'm going to give it again. I'm glad that we both came upon the same one. Uh, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. When we see land as community to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. And that, I think, is the essence of what Leopold's ecologic perspective meant and what has been sorely lacking uh, in public health. And we need to do our job better to become uh, much more ecologically oriented. And I think for agriculture to do its job better, it has to return to its ecologic roots. I was asked several times today about the Farm Bill um, what do public health people have to do with the Farm Bill? And few people were surprised to learn that I had actually been down on Capitol Hill a couple of times this summer advocating with uh, Congress, uh, mostly on the House side, because at that point the Peterson Committee was still uh, debating the House version of the Farm Bill. And this is a list that uh, one of my staff uh, uh, Ronnie Neff, who headed a kind of public health coalition with David Walenga at the International Agriculture Trade Policy Group in Minneapolis, where uh, Dennis is now consulting, uh, and a number of other people around the country. First of all, the Farm Bill needs to emphasize the healthfulness of foods. A lot of promotion of the Farm Bill has been in commodity crops like uh, corn and uh, soybeans, which are so important to Iowa agriculture, but 60 years ago there were 30 other crops important to Iowa agriculture that are healthier for people. We need to rediscover that. Access to healthy food. We need to expand the food stamp system to achieve that equity that I talked about as one of the central drivers. We have to improve access to sustainably produced food, including local food systems and food networks. And there is an opportunity that has been denied through inadequate funding in the previous farm bills uh, to forward, uh, give some forward motion to that. Resource depletion and greenhouse gases, uh, I, if I have time, I'm going to get back to that at the end. 
uh, but clearly everybody is now aware of the challenges of greenhouse gas emissions, global climate change. The conservation title within the Farm Bill leads directly to issues that have a profound public health impact. The quality of the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, uh, and the soil that's going to sustain future generations all depend on having greater uh, conservation-based policies in the Farm Bill. Food sovereignty. We need to respect the ability of poor farmers in low and middle income countries to survive on the cash that they receive for their crops without having to contend with the global commodity market that is artificially depressed because of our farm policy. The overly cheap feed grains are an indirect subsidy uh, for industrial animal producers and they make the grass-fed beef operator operate on an uneven playing field. That has to change. We need greater information for consumers about healthy diet and healthy nutrition. The same federal agency, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, has a food pyramid over here that encourages more fruits and vegetables, fewer fats and sweets, and then over here it has an agricultural support policy that is totally the reverse. We need to change that. Alternative energy sources that can be an important way of dealing uh, creatively with biomass and with other things. Uh, now, Dennis had a wonderful comment this weekend about ethanol. Uh, it was a good idea until we thought about it. <clears throat> and we need to think better about other alternatives. And then finally, something that's so important to people in Iowa, rural communities and the impact. Uh, Betty and Dennis took us on a, a drive yesterday um, through this beautiful rolling farmland, but we also passed through a ghost town of a small town, and I know that's replicated many times throughout the Midwest. We need to figure out how to make small and medium-sized farms uh, productive and profitable again so that we can rebuild and revitalize our rural communities. Now you notice at the bottom the need for public health oversight. That probably strikes some of you as the utmost arrogance typical of the medical profession. What I mean by this is that there are a lot of issues. In addition to the integration of these 10 points I've made, where there is a public health responsibility to broaden our vision to become better informed about the impact of agricultural policies and the food system on the health of the public, which is our professional responsibility to look out for. So who now consumes the world's food? I'm sure a lot of you have seen this slide. Each of us, per capita consumption of about 800 kilograms of grain per year. This is data from the World Watch Institute. Italy, their very nice northern Italian cuisine, 400. Taiwan, 300. China, 250. India, 200. Well, the reason we consume so much is that we first feed it to our animals. 65% of our dietary protein is from animal sources. And it's a not very efficient conversion. About a 7 to 1 conversion for beef, 4 to 1 for pork, and 2 to 1 for poultry. The implications of this system in terms of first raising crops to feed to animals rather than directly to people for a world which still has a billion hungry people are not very promising. China, just look at the projections here. They started out in 1983 consuming 16 million metric tons, uh, tripled, almost tripled that two and a half times in 93, but by 2020 it's estimated that they'll be up to 85 million metric tons and the global consumption will be 303 million metric tons. China is currently increasing its rate of pork consumption on an annual percentage basis, basis that is greater than the total net pork exports of American uh, hog industry. So if it doubles in 30 years, and we were already back in 1961 when Dennis was working on his master's degree, uh, 
we have in, increased our consumption since then by about 70%, now about 100 kilograms per capita, and the average for all of the other industrialized countries is 77 kilograms, and for the non-industrialized, it's 27. There seems to be a direct connection between rising uh, economic development and increasing appetite for meat, and we clearly cannot continue in that direction. More and more inputs are required for this high volume of meat production. Pesticide residues are now entering us, uh, our body through food, water, and air. Uh, we use about a billion pounds a year in the US, and 35% of our food is contaminated with trace amounts of pesticide. There are about 62,000 chemicals, different chemicals produced in the United States. And my toxicology colleagues in the Department of Environmental Health Sciences tell me that a very, very small percentage of those have ever been adequately tested uh, for their toxicity to humans, much less their toxicity to the larger ecosystem. So we have to uh, be cautious about relying on this kind of heavy uh, input to produce the amount of food that is currently being consumed uh, here in the United States. I want to say a little word about food security. When the term was first introduced uh, by the FAO in 1984, uh, the definition was a little simpler. It was refined in 1996 to say that uh, it exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. The original definition did not include the active and healthy life. It was sort of assumed. By this definition, the children attending the public schools of New York City, 25% of them lack food security. A study, the data of which uh, is being currently analyzed in East Baltimore, uh, supported by the Center for a Livable Future, is beginning to look as though it'll be more like 35% of our school-aged children in East Baltimore lack food security. There's a definition coming up in a few slides, and by that definition, not a single one of us in this room have food security. The problem of hunger and famine, uh, a more direct statement of food insecurity, have been with us for millennia. And uh, at the present time, despite a highly productive agricultural system uh, in the industrialized world, about 20 million infants per year are born with low birth weight. And low birth weight at birth is a high risk factor for infant mortality. Uh, and in many of these countries, infant, mortalities are still, infant mortality rates are still up around 100 uh, deaths in the first year of life per 1,000 live births. So, we recognize that food is necessary for life. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which was released uh, December 10th, 1948, included Article 25, everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. It's not surprising at all that food would be first on that list. The Institute of Medicine in 1988, in a report on the future of public health, stated unequivocally that the duty and obligation of government is to create the conditions in which people can be healthy, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services. These are core values, uh, and these are core values that I believe have to be integrated into our analysis of what uh, our current food system needs uh, to change in order to become sustainable. The world food production, uh, particularly in grains, continues to grow. Uh, in 2004, it was over uh, 2 trillion tons. It provided about 322 kilos of uh, grain per person per year. Remember, we're at 800 and Italy's at 400, and Taiwan's at 300, but 322, pretty good. It means almost everybody could eat an Italian diet 
if it were adequately and equitably distributed. But, uh, of course, it hasn't been. So now uh, I'm going to give the revised 2001 food security definition, and you see whether you think uh, that my earlier statement is correct. A world where every person has access to sufficient food to sustain a healthy and productive life, where malnutrition is absent, and where food originates from efficient, effective, and low-cost food systems that are compatible with sustainable use of natural resources. Anybody think we're there? That's setting the bar pretty high. But I believe it is an appropriate challenge, and it's one that I think we can meet. And certainly the work that's been done at the Aldo Leopold Center here uh, in the College of Agronomy uh, and other land-grant universities is helping to point the way. But it really is sobering when you stop and say, well, are these just sort of uh, pie-in-the-sky words, or do they really have meaning? Uh, this is the general mood of the rest of the world uh, taking very seriously uh, the, fo the problems of uh, sustainable agriculture. Now, this is a bit of a cognitive test. We were asked uh, at in preparation for a major dedication of a new building at the School of Public Health a few years ago and the renaming of the school uh, in honor of Michael Bloomberg, the mayor of New York, who happens to be a Hopkins alumnus and, as you've probably read in the newspapers, a wealthy man. And he uh, was going to be giving a major gift and the school is going to be renamed. And we put this booklet together and each unit in the school was asked to sort of summarize your work in one or two slides. So this was our effort. Uh, the, the broad red plane is the actual global pop population. And in 1990, um, we had a population of 5.2 billion people. A grain-based diet of the food that had been produced in 1990, had it been equitably distributed around the world, was sufficient to feed 6.2 billion. So we had a billion population margin of error. However, had the rest of the world tried to eat the way we were eating in 1990, there was only enough food for 2.5 billion people. That's the triple Mac that's uh, shown in the bottom. If we stay the same course we're on right now, and China continues to adopt our dietary patterns and abandon their traditional grain-based diet, and India, which didn't look quite as alarming on that graph as China, but many other middle-income countries are beginning to increase the amount of animal uh, protein in their diet. We would, by estimates of uh, food production, only be able to feed 3.5 to 4 billion people in the year 2025. The population of the world at that time is estimated to be 7.9. We're already at 6.6, .6, adding about 90 million people a year. But if we shift food systems toward a sustainable production of grains, fruits, and vegetables with some uh, meat and dairy, uh, we ought to be able to feed between 9.5 and 10 billion people. But how to mobilize the collective will of farmers around the world and uh, consumers around the world uh, to do that is the big challenge. Now let me just talk a few minutes about the obesity epidemic. Um, much on the minds of many people and especially in public health. We have seen the rates of uh, type 2 diabetes double in the last 15 years. We've seen children, uh, preteens, developing type 2 diabetes, unprecedented when I was uh, in medical school and in training uh, in residency. 17% now of uh, our children and adolescents are overweight, and 32% of the adult population in America is obese. Disparities are emerging, a paradox that the most food insecure among us are at the greatest risk for obesity. We now estimate from a uh, population health perspective that over 300,000 uh, 
premature deaths per year can be attributed to this epidemic, mainly uh, mediated by heart disease, diabetes, cancer, stroke, and the stigma associated with it that's leading to mental illness, depression, and suicide. A conservative estimate is that it's costing us $117 billion uh, in treatment and direct and indirect costs. Some of you have seen this set of maps that I'm going to just click through year by year. The CDC has put these data together. It doesn't look too bad right here, mainly because only 29 of the states weren't providing any data, including Iowa. I don't know why Iowa didn't provide data, but they didn't, 1985. You come in in a few slides. I'm just going to go through it. And here, the darkest color means that up to 14% of the population in that state is obese. And you'll notice that the colors, new colors, have to be added to keep up with the epidemic. Iowa's now in. Now, classic epidemic curve and development. If this were tuberculosis, if this were avian influenza, H5N1 disease, if this were HIV AIDS, people would be screaming from the rooftops, wouldn't they? And yet we haven't made the connection between our food system, our tolerance for $11 billion a year of commercial marketing to get us to eat uh, fast food and to drink uh, high fructose corn syrup sweetened beverages and to eat candies. $65 million a year is spent just to market M&Ms. That's more than the NIH, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, had allocated to it to push the five portions a day of fruits and vegetables in their big campaign in the 90s to try to reduce the prevalence of hypertension. So this is a serious issue. Now, the answer isn't so straightforward. If you take the obesity epidemic, global climate change, healthy, nutritious diet, support for rural communities, just think about these, this question. What's better to eat? Organic grapes that are transported thousands of miles from Chile using fossil fuels. Conventional grapes from California that have been grown using pesticides. Or in-season apples grown in the next town. Our food system is complex. There is no simple, single answer to all of these problems. But we must begin and we must go step by step. And I think a good starting place is the principle of harm reduction, which we use in public health. There are very few perfect solutions in public health. There are no silver bullets. My clinical colleagues and the clinical life that I led for 25 years, we very often had an intervention for a single patient that would dramatically turn things around. A new drug, an operation, something like that. But in public health, uh, we have to weigh many competing demands and try to uh, overall uh, reduce harm to people. Several times today, I've shared the example with uh, colleagues in conversation about needle exchange. Uh, injection drug users are at high risk for transmitting HIV, AIDS, and hepatitis C by sharing dirty works. Uh, a number of studies have now demonstrated that if you provide clean needles, you interrupt the transmission of HIV AIDS and hepatitis C, and you don't increase drug use. In fact, you develop bonds of trust between the drug injection user and the public health system, and they begin to ask about methadone treatment and so on. So what would be the harm reduction approach uh, 
We need to have more information to make informed choices about the pesticide-treated grape from uh, California versus the organically grown grape flown in from Chile. We need to think about the consequences and the consequences of what we do and measure the trade-offs and make some informed policy decisions because we can't turn this system around overnight. Uh, I was impressed by how far apart people live in Iowa. It's going to be hard to find an alternative method of transportation that doesn't require some use of fossil fuel for the foreseeable future. But can we do something about food miles? Can we do something about distribution systems? Can we do something about the inputs to industrialize agriculture that save some of those fossil fuels for uh, use in the transport sector? Good nutrition and a variety of fruits and vegetables are important, but does that mean we need to eat asparagus all year long or raspberries all year long? We have become so accustomed to being able to go into the grocery store and get exactly what we want. I'm old enough to remember that peaches were a seasonal delight. Strawberries were a seasonal delight. Root crops in the fall and winter. And I'm sure many of you remember that as well. So what can we as public health professionals bring to the table to work with you in the agricultural sciences community? Well, individually, we can all make conscious food choice decisions. We can think about the carbon footprint of what we're about to put in our mouth and be guided by that. We can support sustainable agriculture. We can pay that slight premium uh, for locally grown and produced fruits and vegetables, locally grown and produced grass-fed beef, uh, free-range eggs, whatever it is. Uh, we, we have the capacity each time we purchase food to vote the right way. We can link food production and food security to public health through greater emphasis on research and scholarship. Ten years ago, um, when we started the Center for Livable Future, there were a lot of my colleagues who were indulgent of my doing this for two reasons. One, I was an associate dean. And two, I seemed to have a wealthy patron. Um, and I made a very conscious decision that we were going to be a pass-through organization. We were going to use our funds to provide $20,000 innovation grants to students and faculty who were willing to do research on food systems. And with advice from people like Dennis, we developed our innovation grants program. We have now made 60 of these grants over the last seven or eight years. I'm gonna show a few pieces of data from some of those grants on antibiotic resistance in the poultry industry and the hog industry. Um, We've also begun to look at food security issues locally in Baltimore, regionally in the Mid-Atlantic, and uh, with some colleagues looking at the nutrition transition in China. And then a few years later, uh, I was able to raise some additional money to start funding pre-doctoral fellows in our PhD program in the School of Public Health. The only requirement was they had to work on food systems. And specifically, in the first few years, they had to work on public health issues related to industrial uh, food animal production. Well, uh, that Tom Sawyer approach has now led to, we've been able to fund a total of uh, 11 fellows. Uh, four have their PhDs. One has gone on to be one of the first three members of the Department of Environmental Health at uh, University of Maryland College Park, another land-grant institution. Um, another is taking a position at uh, Arizona State. Uh, and we're gradually trying to have the public health agriculture connection uh, strengthened by saying there are a lot of unanswered questions here. How can we uh, stimulate scholarship in this area? Well, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, Dennis here, uh, 
Our society and the natural environment bear the cost of these unintended consequences in the form of environmental and public health impacts. Uh, and the message, the public health message and the agricultural sciences message are beginning to come together in a nice parallel way, which I think is going to be uh, synergistic in the lessons that we learn together. We have to do something from an economic perspective about identifying and capturing the externalities. These aren't included in the retail price of our foods, and we can no longer tolerate uh, the disincentive to do things the right way because uh, the industrialization of agriculture has allowed much of the food system to externalize the cost of pollution, the cost of the risk of uh, infection with antibiotic resistant bacteria, uh, uh, the pollution caused by transporting an increasingly uh, decentralized uh, system that requires many, many food miles for each item. There are other health impacts of food production methods that we also uh, have some data about, but we could really uh, benefit from much better knowledge. Uh, the impacts on the environment and through that impact, how it influences uh, human health. Uh, water, uh, we've got a couple of projects underway looking at trace elements of things like uh, uh, triclosan and tricarban, which are both uh, added to many personal care products and are showing up in water systems throughout the country. Uh, following uh, toxins through the food, uh, through the water system from uh, agricultural runoff uh, and from industrial runoff, it's very hard to tease them out. The important thing is uh, that they together uh, are creating a lot of risk for human health. Water use uh, somewhere between 65 and 70 percent of water throughout the world is used for growing our food, much of it uh, through irrigation. But aquifers are being depleted faster than they're being recharged. Here at home, the Ogallala Aquifer, but the northern plain of China, the Punjab, the breadbasket of India, uh, and other parts of the world. There is a direct relationship between the availability of water and our ability to meet nutrition requirements. It takes about 1,000 tons of water to produce a ton of grain. So are you going to use seven tons of grain to produce a ton of beef and require seven tons, uh, 7,000 tons of water to produce that ton of beef, or are you going to produce 7,000 tons of water to produce uh, seven tons of food for people to eat directly? Chemical use has been an explosive industry in the last 100 years. I mentioned already that there are 62,000 different chemicals manufactured in the United States. We don't know the toxic profile of a small percentage of those. The total amount of uh, chemical fertilizers uh, used worldwide, uh, the nitrogen load that uh, um, I've been learning a lot about the last few days here in Iowa with the extensive tiling of your wet fields and the conduit of those uh, waters into the uh, Des Moines River and ultimately into the Mississippi or in western Iowa into the uh, headwaters of the Missouri. Uh, these are things that are just not uh, sustainable and we have to come to terms with them. Um, most of the chemicals used in the manufacture of pesticide have not been uh, tested. And the direct impact on human health is more severe uh, in middle income and low income countries. I spent a couple of years in El Salvador doing malaria epidemiology for the CDC. And I used to go down to collect blood samples on the Pacific coastal plain and have to scramble out of the way of the crop dusters just as this man in this picture is. Uh, there have been tremendous impacts on negative impacts on human health because of our reliance on pesticides. We have about 76 million cases of foodborne illness a year in the U.S., uh, and much of the uh, increase with produce 
that we've seen in recent years is directly related to contamination with uh, farm animal waste from confinement facilities. So uh, why don't we know more about these problems? Uh, why am I standing here sounding like uh, the public health community has been asleep at the switch for the last 30 years? Well, um, partly we have been, uh, but partly it's because the structure in which we have tried to link uh, at the federal level uh, the agencies responsible for public health and the agencies responsible for our food system haven't done much crosstalk. The NARMS, for example, the National Antibiotic antimicrobial resistance monitoring system is essentially uh, managed by the CDC and the FDA and there's no crosstalk with USDA. Therefore, most of the assumptions about the continued steady rise of antibiotic resistance in bacteria in the United States has been assumed to come from hospital nosocomial infections, whereas increasing evidence suggests that other pathways are more important. These are the FDA approved antimicrobials for use uh, in poultry. The underlying ones are antibiotics that are used in treating human infection. So you can see how much overlap there is. And this is something that should never have been permitted in my view, uh, but we now need to call for a moratorium and stop licensing antibiotics that are critical for human health for use in subtherapeutic doses as growth promoters in confinement operations. There are two very different um, estimates here. The AHI is the Animal Husbandry Institute, an industry-related group, and the UCS stands for Union of Concerned Scientists. So if there's ever a classic example of two people looking at the same thing and having a Rashomon kind of experience, here it is. AHI says that we're spending, uh, using 3.1 million pounds a year for growth promotion. The best estimates of the Union of Concerned Scientists, and I say best because it's very hard to get the data from the industry, are that we're using 27.6 million pounds per year. Prophylaxis and disease treatment, 4.2 14.7 estimated by AHI, uh, 2 million by UCS. And this compares with uh, the amount used for human disease. And I don't know where AHI gets these numbers because they're totally off the wall. But they say 32.3 million, 30, uh, million pounds a year spent treating human infections. And uh, Union of Concerned Scientists say only 4.5. The bottom line is that the best data suggests that about uh, 70 to 75 percent of all the antibiotics produced in the United States are being used as feed additives in the poultry and swine industry for sub-therapeutic uh, growth enhancement and creating a problem of enormous uh, proportions in the area of antibiotic resistance. So this summarized, you see that uh, North Carolina leads the way with over 3 million pounds, and Iowa is close behind, then Georgia, Arkansas, Texas, and then the sum of all human use is in the green bar on the right. What are the conditions that promote resistance? Uh, first of all, crowding. Uh, if you took uh, 2,500 humans and had them spend 24 hours a day in the same space that's allotted to a farrow to finish operation, uh, there would be all kinds of disease. Uh, colds, uh, pneumonias, uh, urinary tract infections, uh, maybe even some sexually transmitted infections. Um, so it's often suboptimal hygiene. The exposure to antibiotics is widespread, prolonged, and in sublethal doses. So the growth promoting dose kills off all the susceptible bugs and the hardy bugs with their genetic resistance that have evolved uh, can begin to dominate the bacterial flora. And then there is very, very poor dose control. Uh, one of my colleagues went into a uh, uh, store on the eastern shore of uh, Maryland and said she needed some tetracycline. 
No questions asked. Actually, one question was asked. Do you want the 25-pound bag or the 50-pound bag? She wasn't a veterinarian. She happens to be an environmental health scientist studying bacterial-resistant organisms, I mean, antimicrobial-resistant organisms. Um, and then she went on to uh, uh, buy the 25-pound bag, uh, not that she was going to use it for anything, but there's absolutely no dose control that we can uh, glean. Uh, the data are usually regarded as proprietary. Uh, fluoroquinolone resistance, I apologize for the uh, messy slide, but um, the point that I'm illustrating here is that if you, in Spain, if you looked at quinoline resistant in human isolates of uh, uh, Clostridium jejuni or Clostridium coli in Spain, it was down below 10% until 1990. At that point, fluoroquinolones were licensed for poultry and livestock. And look what has happened since then. Now, you might argue, well, it looked as though the curve was starting to go up. Who knows? This, this is really related to allowing the cross-use of this antibiotic. But if you then look a little uh, deeper, many places around the world, uh, Canada, uh, New York, uh, Georgia, Oxfordshire, England, um, you find that the pathogens that are common in human infection, E. coli, Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, uh, and so forth, uh, have been traced back either to runoff from farm sites, uh, to uh, manure runoff, or uh, uh, runoff from a fairground where there were animals being shown. And all of these animals had been exposed to subtherapeutic doses. So to summarize this problem, we see that animals, when given antibiotics in their feed, then the antibiotic-resistant bacteria emerge the antibiotic-resistant bacteria in the waste may end up contaminating the meat and in the environment. One of the innovation grants, those 60 grants that I mentioned, uh, allowed one of our graduate students to go out and purchase packaged chicken from 30 different supermarkets around Baltimore, Maryland. He then brought them back to the lab, very carefully opened them under sanitary conditions and cultured uh, the product that looked so nice under the uh, plastic wrapper. Two of the major vertical integrators in the poultry industry, 100% of their chicken product had Campylobacter uh, species isolated from their uh, product. And uh, Bell and Evans, which was not using antibiotics as a growth promoter, uh, had about 50% of their product positive for Campylobacter. The 50% was probably uh, in part because they, uh, in the absence of uh, growth promotion and prophylactic use of antibiotics, were paying closer attention to how frequently they'd cleaned the uh, poultry houses, the broiler houses, uh, and other uh, changes in the bacterial background uh, for those birds. Um, a couple of examples from swine CAFOs. Right here in Iowa, uh, the team at the School of Public Health in Iowa City, uh, Jim Merchant, the dean there, and, and three or four of his colleagues have published a number of studies in the last few years comparing the rates of asthma among children who live on uh, industrialized hog production facility versus control group of uh, children living on uh, smaller hog farms where hogs are being raised in uh, a more sustainable way or children living on farms that are uh, restricted to uh, corn and soybeans. And uh, the children living on those uh, industrial animal facilities have higher rates of respiratory problems, uh, higher rates of asthma, nausea, diarrhea, headaches, plugged ears, which is a, the bane of every pediatrician's life is trying to figure out how to help a, a family get their kids' middle ear infections under control. There are also higher rates of eye, nose, and throat irritation and significantly more episodes of depression, anxiety, anger, fatigue, and confusion among neighbors of swine CAFOs. It's interesting. Uh, we know that uh, hydrogen sulfide is a neurotoxin. 
and people have been killed uh, by high exposure to uh, hydrogen sulfide. Low level exposures, uh, such as can be experienced downwind of a facility that is blowing exhaust fans out from 5,000 or 10,000 animals in confinement, uh, may, be, may be responsible for some of this confusion. Um, Another one of our graduate students sampled air inside a uh, Maryland swine CAFO and found that uh, the mean concentration of airborne bacteria on small fomites uh, was 10 colony forming units per uh, uh, meter of air. Uh, that doesn't sound like a lot, except if you're working in that facility without a respirator she had a respirator on, but most of the uh, agricultural workers who uh, tend these animals uh, don't. Um, the number of meters of uh, air that we uh, breathe, particularly when we're doing physical work, uh, is well over 100 per hour. And so here we have 10 colony units per meter. Uh, 137 presumptive enterococcus species and then other bacterial species also uh, provided. Regardless of which species, enterococci, staphylococci, and streptococci, 98% uh, of all of the isolates were drug resistant, multi-drug resistant. Some uh, as to as many as four different classes of antibiotics and 98% uh, of them to at least two antibiotics. And interestingly, not a single one of the isolates was resistant to vancomycin, which has never been approved by the FDA for use in poultry production or in hog production. These are some of the results. I, it's a busy slide, but just to uh, show that the antibiotic resistant pattern typically included erythromycin, clindamycin, tetracycline, uh, virginiamycin, and bacterial genetics teaches us now that little plasmids that contain uh, bacteria contain genetic units of information that are not bound to the chromosome are swapped freely between different uh, bacterial families. So an enterococcus with a plasmid containing resistant genes to tetracycline cozies up to a staphylococcus and shares a few plasmids. And uh, these bugs are really promiscuous too, by the way. Um, and so then you end up with a staphylococcus that is resistant to uh, tetracycline as well as erythromycin, and maybe in return, they've shared resistant genes to virginiamycin. The same team did uh, water sampling, found 200 presumptive enterococci species. Uh, mean concentration were about uh, uh, 10 squared um, per 100 milliliters in surface water and about uh, 10 uh, colony forming units uh, in groundwater. And both the ground and surface water isolates were downstream of the CAFO displayed patterns of antibiotic resistant that were very similar to what was recovered in the airborne sample. So uh, pretty convincing data from a bacteriologic perspective that uh, workers, neighbors and potentially consumers of the product coming out of that uh, confinement facility were ex being exposed to bacteria with multi-drug resistance. So we need to be uh, aware of the fact that this is a growing problem. It's a problem related to overuse of antibiotics in human medicine, but clearly the contribution from uh, these subtherapeutic applications are an important and growing public health threat. I'm gonna stop here, go a whole bunch of climate change, but I thought I would probably run out of time because there's plenty that I've said that should provoke a few questions. So I'll be happy to take those questions at this time. <clears throat> Right here. How do you the resistance to 
how do I explain the 